What's up, everyone? Grante here, and today we're getting into our next audiobook. We have Principles by Ray Dalio, and the first thing we're going to do is look through this book because it is pretty hefty. Uh, I want to say a good 400 pages, 550 at least. So um, we're going to look in here and see what parts we want to present as audiobooks and which parts we may want to skip through because they're going to be lengthy and not too providing the content that we want on the channel. Anyways, uh, let's go and dive in and take a look here. Principles by Ray Dalio. Principles. Simon and Schuster, okay. To, I'm assuming his wife, Barbara. More Simon and Schuster. And here's what I'm talking about. First 120 pages of this book is probably just gonna be this guy ranting about like his own life, which is fair. And I'm gonna read through it because I want the context, but it's gonna be really incredibly boring to audiobook through. So we'll do a summary, but we're really gonna we're really gonna start down here in part two, page 122. So if you're following along, read through that first part, and then jump in in part two. Uh, because then in part two and part three, it looks like we get into the good stuff, and this is where we can craft like checklists and I just make word documents for each of these chapters that we come across. For example, in the last season or two seasons ago, 15 laws of growth, each of those chapters in my Google Drive is a checklist of things from that chapter, things to add to the calendar. And that's probably what we're going to do here. But thank you for joining. We're going to get this as an audiobook ASAP. This video is part of an audiobook series featuring Principles, Life and Work by Ray Dalio in 2017. For more audiobooks, please visit my YouTube channel, find me on Spotify, or check out my website for downloads. Introduction. Before I begin telling you what I think, I want to establish that I am a dumb shit who doesn't know much relative to what I need to know. Whatever success I've had in life has had more to do with my knowing how to deal with my not knowing than anything I do know. The most important thing I learned is an approach to life based on principles that helps me find out what's true and what to do about it. I'm passing along these principles because I am now at the stage in my life in which I want to help others be successful rather than to be more successful myself. Because these principles have helped me and others so much, I do want to share them with you. But it's up to you to decide how valuable they really are and what, if anything, you want to do with them. Principles are fundamental truths that serve as the foundations for behavior that gets you what you want out of life. They can be applied again and again in similar situations to help you achieve your goals. Every day, each of us is faced with a blizzard of situations we must respond to. Without principles, we would be forced to react to all the things life throws at us individually, as if we were experiencing each of them for the first time. If instead we classify these situations into types and have good principles for dealing with these types, we will make better decisions more quickly and have better lives as a result. Having a good set of principles is like having a good collection of receipts for success. All successful people operate by principles that help them be successful, though what they choose to be successful at varies enormously, so their principles vary. To be principled means to consistently operate with principles that can be clearly explained. Unfortunately, most people can't do that, and it's very rare for people to write their principles down and share them. That is a shame. I would love to know what principles guided Albert Einstein, Steve Jobs, Winston Churchill, Leonardo da Vinci, and others, so I could clearly understand what they were going after and how they achieved it, and could compare their different approaches. I'd like to know which principles are the most important to the politicians who want me to vote for them, and to all the other people whose decisions affect me. Do we have common principles that bind us together as a family, community, a nation, as friends across nations? Or do we have opposing principles that divide us? What are they? Let's be specific. This is a time when it is especially important for us to be clear about our principles. My hope is that reading this book will prompt you and others to discover your own principles from wherever you think is best, and ideally write them down. Doing that will allow you and others to be clear about what your principles are, and understand each other better. 
It will allow you to refine them as you encounter more experiences and to reflect on them, which will help you make better decisions and be better understood. Having your own principles. We come by our principles in different ways. Sometimes we gain them through our own experience and reflections. Sometimes we accept them from others, like our parents, or we adopt holistic packages of principles such as those of religions and legal frameworks. Because we each have our own goals and our own natures, each of us must choose our own principles to match them. While it isn't necessarily a bad thing to use others as principles, adopting principles without giving them much thought can expose you to the risk of acting in ways inconsistent with your goals and your nature. At the same time, you, like me, probably don't know everything you need to know and would be wise to embrace that fact. If you can think for yourself while being open-minded in a clear-headed way to find out what is best for you to do, and if you can summon up the courage to do it, you will make the most of your life. You can't, if you can't do that, you should reflect on why that is because that's most likely your greatest impediment to getting more of what you want out of life. And that brings me to my first principle. Think for yourself to decide one, what you want, two, what is true, and three, what you should do to achieve number one in light of number two. And do that with humility and open-mindedness so that you consider the best thinking available to you. Being clear on your principles is important because they will affect all aspects of your life many times a day. For example, when you enter into relationships with others, your principles and their principles will determine how you interact. People who have shared values and principles get along. People who don't will suffer through constant misunderstandings and conflicts. Think about the people you are closest to. Are their values aligned with yours? Do you even know what their principles or values are? Too often in relationships, people's principles aren't clear. This is especially problematic in organizations where people need to have shared principles to be successful. Being crystal clear about my principles is why I labored so much over every sentence in this book. The principles you choose can be anything you want them to be, as long as they are authentic, i.e. as long as they reflect your true character and values. You will be faced with millions of choices in life, and the way you make them will reflect the principles you have. So it won't be long before the people around you will be able to tell the principles you are really operating by. The worst thing you can be is a phony, because if you're a phony, you will lose people's trust and your own self-respect. So you must be clear about your principles, and then you must walk the talk. If inconsistencies seem to exist, you should explain them. It's best to do that in writing, because by doing so, you will refine your written principles. While I will be sharing my own principles, I want to make clear to you that I don't expect you to follow them blindly. On the contrary, I want you to question every word and pick and choose among these principles so you come away with a mix that suits you. My Principles and How I Learned Them I learned my principles over a lifetime of making a lot of mistakes and spending a lot of time reflecting on them. Since I was a kid, I've been a curious, independent thinker who ran after audacious goals. I got excited about visualizing things to go after, had some painful failures after going after them, learned principles that would prevent me from making the same sort of mistakes again, and changed and improved which allowed me to imagine and go after even more audacious goals, and do that rapidly and repeatedly for a long time. So to me, life looks like a sequence you see on the opposite page. I believe that the key to success lies in knowing how to both strive for a lot and fail well. By failing well, I mean being able to experience painful failures that provide big learnings without failing badly enough to get knocked out of the game. This way of learning and improving has been best for me because of what I'm like and because of what I do. I've always had a bad rote memory and didn't like following other people's instructions, but I loved figuring out how things work for myself. I hated schools because of my bad memory, but when I was 12, I fell in love with trading the markets. To make money in the markets, one needs to be an independent thinker who bets against the consensus and is right. That's because the consensus view is baked into the price. One is inevitably going to be painfully wrong a lot, so knowing how to do that well is critical to one's success. To be a successful entrepreneur, the same is true. One also has to be an independent thinker who correctly bets against the consensus, 
which means being painfully wrong a fair amount. Since I was both an investor and an entrepreneur, I developed a healthy fear of being wrong and figured out an approach to decision making that would maximize my odds of being right. 2. Make believably weighted conditions or decisions. My painful mistakes shifted me from having a perspective of, I know I'm right, to having one of, how do I know I'm right? They gave me the humility I needed to balance my audacity. Knowing that I could be painfully wrong and curiosity about why other smart people saw things differently prompted me to look at things through the eyes of others, as well as my own. That allowed me to see many more dimensions than if I saw things through just my own eyes. Learning how to weigh people's inputs so that I chose the best ones, in other words, so that I believably weighted my decision making, increased my chances of being right and was thrilling. At the same time, I learned to operate by principles that are so clearly laid out that their logic can easily be assessed and you and others can see if you walk the talk. Experience taught me how invaluable it is to reflect on and write down my own decision-making criteria whenever I make a decision, so I got in the habit of doing that. With time, my collection of principles became like a collection of recipes for decision-making. By sharing them with the people at my company, Bridgewater Associates, and inviting them to help me test my principles in action, I continually refined and evolved them. In fact, I was able to refine them to the point that I could see how important it is to systemize your decision making. I discovered I could do that by expressing my decision making criteria in the form of algorithms that could be embedded into computers. By running both decision making systems, i.e. mine in my head and mine in the computer next to each other, I learned that the computer could make better decisions than me because it could process vastly more information than I could and it could do it fast and unemotionally. Doing that allowed me and the people I worked with to compound our collective decision making. I discovered that such decision making systems, especially when believability is weighted, are incredibly powerful and will soon profoundly change how people around the world make all kinds of decisions. Our principle driven approach to decision making has not only improved our economic, investment, and management decisions, it has helped us make better decisions in every aspect of our lives. Whether or not your own principles are systematized, computerized, is of secondary importance. The most important thing is that you develop your own principles and ideally write them down, especially if you are working with others. It was that approach and the principles it yielded, and not me, that took me from being an ordinary middle-class kid from Long Island to being successfully by a number of conventional measures, like a starting a company out of my two-bedroom apartment and building it into the fifth most important private company in the U.S., according to Fortune magazine, becoming one of the 100 richest people in the world, according to Forbes, and being considered one of the 100 most influential, according to Time. They led me to a perch from which I got to see success in life very differently than I had imagined, and they gave me the meaningful work and meaningful relationships I value even more than my conventional successes. They gave me and Bridgewater far more than I ever dreamed of. Until recently, I didn't want to share these principles outside of Bridgewater because I don't like public attention, and because I thought it would be presumptuous to tell others what principles to have. But... After Bridgewater successfully anticipated the financial crisis of 2008 and 9, I got a lot of media attention and so did my principles in Bridgewater's unique way of operating. Most of those stories were distorted and sensationalistic, so in 2010, I posted our principles on our website so people could judge for themselves. To my surprise, they were downloaded over 3 million times, and I was flooded with thank you letters from all over the world. I will give them to you in two books, Life and Work Principles in one book and Economic and Investment Principles in the other. How these books are organized. Since I have spent most of my adult life thinking about economies and investing, I considered writing economic and investing principles first, but I decided to begin with my life and work principles because they are more overarching, and I've seen how well they work for people independent of their careers. Since they go so well together, they are combined here in one book prefaced by a short autobiography titled Where I'm Coming From. Part 1, Where I'm Coming From. 
In this part, I share some of the experiences, most importantly, the mistakes, that led me to discover the principles that guide my decision making. To tell you the truth, I have mixed feelings about telling my personal story because I worry that it might distract you from the principles themselves and from the dauntless, or sorry, timeless and universal cause-effect relationships that inform them. For that reason, I wouldn't mind if you decided to skip this part of the book. If you do read it, try to look past me and my particular story to the logic and merit of the principles I describe. Think about them, weigh them, and decide how much, if at all, they apply to you and your own life circumstances, and specifically, whether they can help you achieve your goals, whatever they may be. Part 2. Life Principles The overarching principles that drive my approach to everything are laid out in Life Principles. In this section, I explain my principles in greater depth and show how they apply in the natural world, in our private lives and relationships, in business and policy making, and of course at Bridgewater. I'll share the five-step process I've developed for achieving one's goals and making effective choices. I'll also share some of the insights I've gained into psychology and neuroscience and explain how I've applied them in my private life and in my business. This is the real heart of the book because it shows how these principles can be applied by most anything, by most anyone. Part 3. Work Principles In Work Principles, you'll get a close-up view of the unusual way we operate at Bridgewater. I will explain how we've coalesced our principles into an idea meritocracy that strives to deliver meaningful work and meaningful relationships through radical truth and radical transparency. I'll show you how this works at a granular level and how it can be applied to nearly any organization to make it more effective. As you will see, we are simply a group of people who are striving to be excellent at what we do and who recognize that we don't know much relative to what we need to know. We believe that thoughtful, unemotional disagreement by independent thinkers can be converted into believability-weighted decision-making that is smarter and more effective than the sum of its parts. Because the power of a group is so much greater than the power of an individual, I believe these work principles are even more important than the life principles upon which they are based. Think for yourself. What do you want? What is true? And what are you going to do about it?